Hello, so I'm Ashley MacDonald. I'm a technologist within the luxury industry. I've spent the last few years working with groups like LVMH and now I work for Google in a luxury role. And I'm super happy to be here today to speak to Perry Odgan. So he's a filmmaker, he's a photographer. He has worked all over the world with the biggest names in the industry. And I think we're, we're really lucky to be able to ask you the different questions we have today to understand your career and how you got to where you are today. So welcome, Perry. Oh, thank you, Ashley. Very happy to be here. Um, thank you. And can I start with just asking you, how did it all begin for you? Uh, I think it really began by looking at magazines and looking at pictures. Uh, probably initially at music magazines like New Music Express, Melody Maker Sounds back in the 70s uh, when I was still in school. And that sort of gave me an interest in pop culture, popular culture, and from there, I started looking at fashion magazines. Great, okay. So I know a little bit from, from your work that you originally did start your own magazine when you were still in school. Could you tell us a little bit about that, how you had this startup mindset already from a really young age to create something that didn't exist? Yes, yeah, so I think that uh, when I was about 13, I probably got my first camera, 13, 14, a Zenith, a Zenith E, for those who know about Russian cameras that will ring a bell. Um, it's, it's a long story. Uh, my mother was the women's page editor of the London Times when I was very young and I was at school across the road from the Times office in Printing House Square at a school called the City of London. So after school I would play football, then be thrown out of the school playground and wander over to my mum's office and she'd give me some things to do, drawing or whatever, but she would then get somebody from the printing works. At that time, all the newspapers were printed on site, so a whole floor of this building would have been dedicated to that. And one of the printers would have taken me off and got me to set my name in type, in lead type, or do something like that, and then take me to the cafe to get a cup of tea and a cheese roll. I remember that very well. And I just started taking interest, you know, in, in, in I guess that was my original looking at magazines and papers, just being in a paper. Uh, but it seemed very, very unconscious at the time. And uh, later, I went to school at Eton. My mother died uh, when I was 11, and then I got sent away to school. And at Eton, we started doing photography, making pinhole cameras. And we were in the darkroom processing the film, and it sort of brought back the smells of the printing works in The Times and memories of my mother. And so it was a very powerful, uh, sense, if you like. Um, and then I started to look at these music magazines and I decided I wanted to be a photographer quite early on. Probably by 14 or 15 I had the sense that that was what I might do. And I started getting holiday jobs with, with a photographer. Uh, also my aunt, Bridget Keenan, who's still alive, very much alive, um, was a fashion journalist. She, my mother had been born in Rangoon and my aunt Bridget had been born in India and I guess they were probably sent to England for school when they got to a certain age and at a very young age my aunt Bridget became probably with the help of my mother became a fashion editor at the Sunday Times in the very late 50s. So there was you had this exposure from a really young age to print to fashion to the industry and international experience as well very international especially for the Times yeah and that led you to having this passion and a vision? Definitely. And I think then I started working for a photographer in London called John Timbers, who um, he had worked with Tony Armstrong Jones, who became Lord Snowden for about five or six years before Snowden got married and was then meant to give up photography by royal decree because it was a trade and, and royals don't do that. And so um, John was let out on his own and started doing some of the things that uh, Snowden had been doing and doing portraits for Vogue and theatre things. And so when I was working with John, initially just making cups of tea and coffee and sweeping the floor, <laughs> it, was great, it was a great way to learn because it was like an old fashioned Victorian apprenticeship. And uh, John had everything in this, you know, he'd had his office, he had the studio, he had a dark room, they had a retoucher, he shared the studio with a photographer called Zoe Dominic, who was the kind of Annie Leibovitz of her day. Uh, and did a lot of film people, was great friends with Warren Beatty, did all the pictures for Red, the film, which I remember sorting all the Kodachromes for. And so it was a great learning curve 
and John would photograph uh, people like John Gielgud and Laurence Olivier and um, Barry Humphreys, Dame Edna, uh, doing portraits in the studio. So you got to see all this. And then, of course, as, as I learned more and John taught me to develop film and to make prints and to you know, use the lights and the cameras. And, and I guess he was the first one who let me use the studio to do my own pictures. So that was probably just after I'd left school when I was working for him. So um, this all led to me doing this magazine, Lipstick. Uh, in school, in my last year at school with a group of friends, we got together and we did a one-off magazine that was loosely inspired by Andy Warhol's interview and David Bailey and David Litchfield's Ritz newspaper, which in turn had been inspired by interview. And so here, here's the, uh, it was a one-off magazine in, in my last year. And Amazing. the cover girl was my girlfriend at the time, uh, dressed up in the school uniform. And then, you know, we went to interview Joe Strummer from The Clash. Wow. For example, that was taken in the Edgware Road. Uh, he agreed to meet us in the milk bar. And my friend when Justin you, came with me. And he when made. you were creating this, how how did you come up with the ideas? Did you already have an idea of who you were creating it for? Or was it more so, we want to speak to these people and creating this magazine will give us the opportunity to connect with them? I think that we wanted to do something that was different to the Eden College Chronicle, uh, which was fairly staid and old fashioned. And so we wanted to do something that was a little more punk, uh, if you like, because the punk aesthetic, you know, at that time, was for a couple of years had been massive and was a huge influence. Um, that kind of do-it-yourself, that anybody can do what they like. You know, you don't even need to know three chords to go and play in a band. You can just be good looking like Paul Simonon and, and Bell. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, uh, and I went to New York to interview Andy Warhol. Amazing. And he and his friends uh, took me to Studio 54. That was quite an eye-opener. And also while I was in New York, I photographed and interviewed Diana Breeland who was the most amazing, most amazing woman uh, and was just incredibly enthusiastic and helpful and she rang up Richard Abaddon while I was there to say that he should meet me and you know, I was totally embarrassed of course. Unfortunately Abaddon was going to China the next day so it, it never happened but um, I, Abaddon's show at the Met had just been on, it had just closed. Uh, this is probably April 79, um, but I did get a copy of his amazing book. Uh, the book that was the book from the Met show. And then David Bailey was the other person. And Bailey was really my introduction to photography and fashion photography in that I went to, uh, he was one of the first photographers that I, whose work I became really aware of. In I guess, probably through Ritz newspaper. And, you know, I went to seek out Goodbye Baby and Our Men, his, his book from the late 60s. And um, later, my aunt, who used to work with Bailey and Shrimpton in the early 60s, the three of them would go on shoots together before you even had hair and makeup. And Shrimpton, Jean Shrimpton would do her own hair and makeup. And uh, my auntie Bridget would provide the clothes and Bailey would take the pictures and do all the direction, no doubt. And, um, she later gave me a copy of Bailey's Box of Pinups, which is a, a, an amazing collector's item now, but he couldn't get rid of them at the time. Um, so yeah, that, that, was, that, was a, that was a big influence. And you know, the great thing about this magazine is that I remember I was in charge of the advertising as well, and we went and got really great advertisers, like Olympus. So there was, there was a connection between the advertising and the editorial, um, and this, Margie Bridget had done a book called The Women We Wanted to Look Like. So that was a, which had just been published at the time. So there you got it's Twiggy, Jean Shrimpton. Fantastic. Harry it's really Harbin, like a capsule, a historic Harry capsule Kennedy, of the time. And Verushka. Just the, those were the ones we chose. Uh, Andy Warhol gave us some images that we could use. It was a sports series, sadly not the originals. The, uh, the chromes, and then we did an article about Fever. They did the makeup for the cover. 
and really Pino, beautiful. Pino was started by a woman called Barbara Hulaniki and had an amazing store in uh, High Street Kensington at that time. I guess one of the, one of the early fashion emporiums. Uh, and then of course they did makeup. Uh, so that that was my, you know, and then there were other, there were other, some things about, you know, eating the sticks and stones of Eton and some other things that mixed in with it. Um, and yeah, so that was my first experience of sort of putting together a magazine. And it was done for the 4th of June holiday. And so we went out and, and sold them on the day. And we had already made a profit before we even sold a copy. Uh, but we, you could, you were, I think the rule was you could make 25 pounds from it. And then anything after that had to go to, to a local charity, which was perfect, no problem. We were up for that. So myself and, uh, uh, yeah, I'm just looking back at the few. So myself and Rory Phillips were the co-editors, contributing editors Justin Adams, Hugo Verica. Justin's now guitarist for uh, Robert Plant's band. Uh, that's what he always wanted to do, and I wanted Incredible. to do. So, to and do so I imagine at the time this was a highly innovative, really modern, perhaps even controversial creation at the time. I guess so, but you know, when you're doing these things, you never think about that. You're just, you're just thinking about what you want to do. And yes, you're breaking with tradition and that you want to do something that's a bit more exciting than, than what's on hand and what's being done to date. Um, but I, I just, it's a bit like the Pony Kids much later. You, you, you don't think about it at the time that it, it could still have a life in 20 years, 20 years later, you're just, it just it's important at that moment and I think that's what's crucial about doing things never think about the posterity always think about the moment and what what you really want to do and what's appealing to you and and what you're excited about absolutely um, so Perry just to go back to something that you said about when you're in the creation process when you're in the dark rooms that memories really came back to you because of the smell around print around these uh, traditional methods of actually creating Today, that's something that we don't really have in the digital world. Tell me a little bit about how you feel about that and how you transitioned into this more digitalized era. Yeah, digital has been a big revolution. And I, I probably started doing digital a little later than many people uh, because I just love, I love film. And even though at that stage, let's say this is probably the early to mid, I'd say probably mid noughties, before I started really doing 2005, 2006, probably the earliest digital images I was doing. I remember doing something in the States for a store there and they wanted it on digital. And so we got some people in California, the shoot was in LA and we got some people there who were, who were at the cutting edge of doing it. And that, that was really useful. Um, but I would go, you know, my, my printer, uh, Brian Dowling from BDI, uh, has been doing all my work for God, 25 years, maybe longer now. And um, we've always worked together. And even if we were just doing but before digital, I would always go over from Ireland or from wherever I was to be in London for a, a day or two with him while he was printing. Because there was, even though I wasn't in the dark room with him, there was a magic as an image would come out and maybe Brian hadn't missed something in the dark room, but it, it came out sort of beautifully. And then, um, you know, unexpectedly, and we, we would go with that. Uh, so it was important to be there. And then later, when it became clear that we'd have to do some digital, you know, commercially for clients, then um, I would shoot some film, sort of get a few frames of each shot on film, process that, do a print with that the normal way, and then say, okay, once we get the digital file to that point, we'll see what else we can do. But for me, it became more about trying to match film rather than going off into the digital world. So the problem with digital is too sharp, it's too hard edged, it's too everything. And so it was all about bringing it down and bringing it back. And, and you know, for me, my photography has always sort of been less is more and you know, understated and subtle, if you like, in, in terms of the color palettes and um, ideas and the way it's done. So that, that was my approach to digital. And of course it has, 
you know, revolutionized in some very good ways and that we can go out and, you know, at a moment's notice, you can, you can film things and take pictures. Um, but I think what it's done in the world of fashion, it's slightly diluted everything. And I think of the fashion and images that I looked at as a, as a kid and when I was starting out, um, that yeah, sure, fashion and fashion magazines were ephemeral, but there were images within that and, and photographers working within that who were artists and whose images still stand up today. Um, you know, Bailey, for example, Helmut Newton, you know, some of these people's photographs sell for hundreds of thousands at auction and, um, you know, including fashion pictures. Uh, and I think that now there's some really great work, you know, there's definitely good work and really strong work, but I think there's a lot of junk. And I think that people's attention spans are much less. They say it's seven seconds now looking at social media. A lot of research has been done on that. And so we move on very quickly. So the work doesn't have to sustain you for very long to have an impact. Absolutely. And I think um, what's interesting as well is digital, it's, it has somewhat democratized a lot of different industries, but it's also brought down the barriers to entry, which means we do have a huge flood of content, which we didn't have before, because it's much easier to create and to share. But it also makes things sometimes easier. It brings a lot of opportunities for people to launch themselves um, where it may, may not have been possible otherwise. And I know that for you, for example, you created your magazine at the beginning. That would have been incredibly hard for quite a lot of people to do. But today, anyone can launch a digital magazine, for example, um, on their own. And so I think there are good things that come from it, but then also perhaps we're getting further away from the original craft, whether it's photography or whether it's filmmaking. And I know um, you still work in dark rooms and you've gone back to that a little uh, recently. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think that, um, I think it's just become a different craft. So, uh, you know, and it's the very early stages of digital. You know, in some ways you could say that photography and digital are two different things. And some people might even say that digital isn't photography. So, you know, there's a, a long discussion that you could have there that could go on for many, many years. Um, I think that, you know, I found myself, uh, I'm currently working on a book uh, of my pictures from over the years. A, a filmmaker here in, in Ireland, Kieran McCormick, has just made a film about me and my work. Uh, that premiered at the Dublin Film Festival, Festival in March, just before the lockdown. And okay. will hopefully be out again in September at festivals and will then get a release. Uh, and so I'm working on a book that will go alongside that. So of course she went back to the very beginning and, and looking at how I started and the early work and later work and um, shoots for Vogue Italia and Luomo Vogue and uh, all sorts of different things. And so recently, I was going through the archive quite extensively, still am, and, and trying to find things and, and you know, bags and bags of negatives that are all here in my studio. And I just said, you know what, I, I just want to go into the dark room and start looking at some of these again. You know, I could get someone to digitize them and just, but I actually wanted to go in and be in the dark. And I get, it was probably the first time in 20 years that I had been in a dark room printing. And, and it was a wonderful, the first day, it was just wonderful and brought back a lot of memories. And, and it's just a completely different experience being in there in the dark, shining the light on the paper, a, an image appearing slowly in the, in the developer. And um, it's, you know, it, it makes you think about image making in a different way. Because yeah, grade a phone and, and whatever else, you can go out on the street and just immediately get some pictures and, and you know, you're making pictures, but I, I find that a lot of these pictures, they're great if you look at them on a phone, but if you if you blow them up bigger and, and look at them in any, any more detail, they don't really hold up. Absolutely, I think it comes down to, again, the idea of attention span and the format that we look at content in. If people are creating content to be consumed for six seconds on a mobile phone, it doesn't have the same objective as when you do a full shoot and you're thinking this is going to be on a billboard, this is going to be in a magazine. So as you said, perhaps it's actually a different craft now to what it was before. 
Yeah, I think it is. And, you know, we, we won't know really about the images for some years because, you know, it'll be interesting to see which images from from this decade, uh, or for, more importantly, from the last decade, uh, hold up in 20, 30 years time in the same way that we can look back at 80s, 90s and have a sense of, of what stands out um, and go back further, 60s and 70s. And, and there are certain things that stand out and, and then we discover somebody new that hadn't been so well known at the time. And you know, this, this is always kind of exciting. So who, who knows in 20, 20 years, 30 years, what images will stand out from today. Exactly. Maybe you'll be releasing a digital book with all of your digitally created content over the last 20 years. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, so Perry, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your travels. I know you've traveled all over the world. You've also lived in some of the, the creative capitals. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how that has impacted you and your creative process. Well, you know, in, in the early days, I went to New York, as I said, for the magazine. And then I went back to New York once I'd started up as a photographer a few times for jobs. And I just found it very exciting. And um, at the time, uh, I remember going to stay with Keith Herring uh, and his boyfriend, Juan Dubose, who was a DJ in, in the nightclub area. Uh, my girlfriend's sister, Sam, Samantha McEwen, she shared a flat. She'd been to art school with Keith and shared a flat and I needed a place to stay for a week. And so she said, oh, come stay with me. You can stay in my room. And, and that was brilliant in, in on Broome Street, uh, Lower East Side. Uh, the building is still there. I saw it the last last uh, in January when I, I walked by. And um, you know that experience and New York at that time was very exciting in the early 80s. So in '84, I thought you know I'd rather be in New York. That's the sort of center of photography, and uh, which it was at that time. You know I wanted to be there and see if I could get some work there and, and have the experience of living there. So essentially I based myself in New York from about 84 to 87 and, and was back and forward to London and doing things for, you know, The Face magazine um, and various others. Uh, so it was a very, um, it was an inspirational time. To, and it was just a great city to have that experience of living in. It's a city I love very much. It's changed quite a bit since, but it's still, I still get a buzz when I go back there on that journey in from the airport. When you see the skyline of Manhattan, you know, I still get a buzz and it's exciting to be here and what am I going to do and da 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 da. So, and on my last trip, I did a podcast with Grace Coddington for the National Gallery here in Ireland. And, you know, Grace is somebody whose work I've looked at since I started looking at magazines. Uh, in the, let's say, mid 70s, when she was uh, one of the fashion editors there. So, you know, all those great shoots with people like Norman Parkinson. And then you think of, of her life, you know, she was modeling from the very late 50s and um, has worked behind and in front of the camera with, with you know, most of the very great photographers like Guy Bourdin and Helmut Newton. And um, up until, you know, more recently with Stephen Meisel, um, who I think is probably one of the, uh, probably the great fashion photographer of the last 30 years or so. And um, so that was exciting. You know, there's always, some, there's always something new to explore. And um, so then other cities I've lived in, I lived in Paris for a while, but I wasn't really taking pictures then. That was in the early 90s. And I was living between Connemara in the west of Ireland and Paris. And I was learning to draw and to paint, going to different ateliers. And um, I suddenly got a call out of the blue. Two people called me. Uh, an editor called Isabella Stanhope who had been at Vogue and she wanted to do a shoot for Elle magazine that she was now an editor at in uh, Connemara and she knew Helena Christensen and we got Helena to come to Connemara and be a circus girl and I got a couple of my actor friends to sort of be extras and we set them up in, in like an Irish traveller silver uh, caravan, metallic caravan as if they were living out in the middle of nowhere and um, going about their life. So, and that was a very exciting shoot to do. And then I did a shoot for W Magazine uh, when it was relaunched under creative director Dennis Friedman. And Dennis wanted to do something in Ireland and would I do it? And so I wasn't really doing photos, but these were the things that I, I jumped at. 
and we did a shoot in Connemara with Cecilia Chancellor that became quite an iconic shoot. And um, it was sort of time of deconstructed fashion, if you like, so it worked. You know, this is really important when you're, when you're taking fashion pictures, that the clothes work in the situation with the girl or the guy or the kids or whoever you're photographing them on. But for me, it's important that it always looks natural, that they dress themselves and that, um, you know, and, and then it's a little sort of supernatural in a way, if you like, because you're just upping it a little bit. So we did this shoot for W Magazine. And the next thing we can call from Ralph Lauren, very interested to do some, some work. And did I have any pictures to, you know, could I send them my portfolio? But really I didn't, I didn't have any pictures. I don't think the L pictures had even come out. And the only picture I had was a project I was doing in Connemara for myself, which was photographing all my neighbors uh, who were digging the bog and piling up the peat. And um, it was a series that it hadn't been published, but I was, I was doing it. And then a friend of mine in, in Japan, Maki Fujimoto, uh, a creative director and then photographer who I had worked with a bit in London, um, said, am I doing anything? You know, he's doing this little book, like four photographers. And so these pictures I gave to him. And so these are all, this was in the bog in Connemara. I'm not sure how well you can see it in there. But Absolutely fantastic. That might get a sense of the yeah. image. And um, so, so... These were your neighbours in Connemara? These were all my neighbours in Connemara. <laughs> and I was just living in a little cottage that didn't even have a road to it. And I wrote a little piece to go with a little poem. And um, this is what I sent. I had the prints of these. And I just sort of packaged them up in, in, a, in a plastic folder and sent them off to Ralph, to those are just a few, uh, to Ralph Lauren. And Ralph himself went mad about these pictures and the clothes and the way they were being worn. And, you know, some of it was like Tom de Gasson outfits in a way. Uh, and so the next thing I knew, I was doing a big campaign in Ireland for Ralph Lauren. And so my photography career started again. And I hadn't thought I'd be doing photographs again, you know, for magazines and commercially. But I had that three year period in Paris of painting and sort of studying and, and being a student. And I think that was quite fruitful and that I hadn't done that before. I'd gone straight from school into working. And so it was a time to kind of re-examine and to look at things and to learn a bit more about color and form uh, that became invaluable because then everything just sort of took off again. Fantastic. I think it's great to hear about these journeys where you weren't necessarily going in with a specific objective, but as things went along, different opportunities arose. You went in for it and you were ready. Um, you know, you had the, the courage to share these images with Ralph Lauren from the, the bog in Connemara, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, if we go back to your connection with Ireland, I think it's, uh, it's important for me to highlight as well, you know, you, you put Ireland on the scene in terms of fashion and photography, especially with your images um, from your books, such as Pony Kids, uh, Paddy and Lean. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Because you've worked a lot with the traveling community and you have a, quite a beautiful focus on Irish folklore as well in these images. It'd be great to understand more about your connection with this. Yeah, well, I think I've always had an interest in the traveling community because when I first came to Ireland, uh, Marina Guinness, who uh, was my initial guide and became my girlfriend and the mother of my eldest daughter, Vala, um, you know, she took me to meet circus people and, and travellers. And so some of the first pictures I took in Ireland were, uh, were of travellers and circus people and the Court Courtney's Circus. And, um, so, you know, so I, and obviously I heard the story about them and, you know, the discrimination against them. And I just thought, wow, that, you know, these people are, are actually truly fascinating because they're they're living a different kind of life to the rest of us, um, and a life that's sort of more rooted in the earth, if you like. Um, so, I'd, so I'd always had an interest, and then I think it was in the mid, early to mid '90s, uh, a friend of mine, James Mathers, uh, from America, was in Dublin, and he said, "Have you been to the horse fair? You know, it's only around the corner from your studio." I said, I said, you know, I've never been to this fair. It was that, at that time, it was a big horse fair right in the middle of Dublin. And um, so I started going to it and taking some pictures. And I thought, wow, how will I capture, 
know, I'd love to, I'd love to find a way to capture this, but, but in a different way to just taking pictures of kids in the horse fair in that background. You know, although I did take some of those pictures uh, while I was considering what I could do. And in the end, um, I came up with this idea of just setting up a studio in the horse fair and pulling people out of the crowd to make portraits of them. Some with their horses, some on their own, some with their pigeons, um, whatever it might be, their rabbits. And uh, I just started whenever I was in Dublin on the first Sunday of a month, because it happened once a month. Uh, I would go early in the morning uh, with my assistants and friends and we'd set up a studio and start taking portraits. But by about midday one o'clock, you'd, you'd have to leave because you were swarmed with people and kids would be coming back saying, Mr, Mr, get me on this one and uh, bringing up another horse they wanted to show off. And it just became too much. And of course, the horse <laughs> looking in the background, they can go a bit nuts as well. So we'd always have to bail out quite early in the day, but um, having got some good pictures. So after a couple of years of doing this, I, you know, this idea came up to have an exhibition in the, in Smithfield itself. So we blew up all these pictures on a photocopy I had with, with the, some of the money I'd, I'd got from Ralph Lauren doing a few campaigns for them I'd bought this very expensive color photocopier but it was an amazing machine you could put a, a 12 by 16 print in and it would eject a 16 it would blow it up so you've got 16 pieces that you could um, then piece together and make quite a large print so we made the prints that way and we had a big team all gluing them together um, perfectly and mounting them on some board and then putting some some clear plastic on top and we screwed them into the walls in Smithfield and President Mary Robinson came to open the exhibition and I guess we, it was about being in solidarity with uh, the kids and their horses and the horse owners it was a big thing at the time and um, you know a lot of these kids were coming either from a traveler background or from you know the satellite suburbs of Dublin that were infested with heroin so that to me this was a very positive thing for them to be with horses I know there were some complications powers that be never looked at the positive basically tried to wipe it out and I think too it was this sort of fascination of travelers who were being settled particularly on the outskirts of, of Dublin um, encouraged to settle forced to settle maybe in some cases uh, the coming together of their culture with the urban kids who were all about sort of you know, Adidas and Nike, and then their haircuts, that sort of pony kid haircut. Um, so that was fascinating. Absolutely. Um, so there are two people in particular that you worked with over, I think, a 10 year period, Paddy and Neen. Could you tell us a little bit about how that came about, how you worked with them, and maybe, you know, what are they doing today? Yeah, Paddy and Liam, they were, so I show you that book. It's just. Yes, please. Um, so yeah, Paddy, and on the back cover, Liam. Brilliant. Who wants to be on the front cover, but hey. <laughs> Did you flip a coin or how was that the thing? You can't have everything. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what happened was that um, the magazine asked me to do just some pictures in Ireland. And I uh, said, no, I'd love to, I knew Paddy and Liam because actually it was Violet's mother, Marina, who is my, my guide and, and one-time girlfriend, uh, had met the parents of Paddy and Liam. Uh, they'd lived up the road from her and she had gone past and seen a car that she wanted to buy or something like that. And then one day there was a terrible accident at the crossroads where they were living and one of their a young cousin got knocked down by a car and, and killed. So everybody wanted to flee the scene, the extended family that were there. And uh, Tommy and Mary, Paddy and Liam's parents, uh, just came up to Marina's house, told her, told her what had happened and said they didn't want to move from the area because they were on the housing list. And if they moved out of the county, they would be very quickly taken off the housing list. So Marina said, well, yeah, pull up your caravan in the garden there and you can live there for the time being. So incredibly generous. And um, I'm not sure, maybe, um, I think Liam is the eldest, it's about a year between them. So maybe Liam was, had been born, Paddy had, or, you know, they were very, very young at that point. So, you know, I was around a bit and, and just got to see them grow up. So when they were about, I don't know, eight, nine, I thought, um, 
yeah, it'd be great to document these guys. They're now settled. They were living in a house in Selbridge, just outside Dublin. And um, I thought, yeah, I'd do, it. I'd do like a few days in their life. And there was a big fun fair that had come into Selbridge. So we did some pictures there. Then them going fishing or hanging out by the river. I'm not sure exactly how much fishing they got done, but different things like that. <laughs> spent, spent some time with them. And uh, yeah, and, I, and it was, a, it was a, a good story. So then I did a follow up with them a few years later. And then I went out and, and the second, so the first time they were just wearing their clothes that I'd kind of selected, wear this, wear that, or oh, that's too bright or whatever. And the second time uh, I got Tara St. Hill, who's the great star, stylist, to come and actually style them. And so they wore, they wore, you know, fashion if you like. And then after that, I thought, you know, it'd be great to do, it was actually the idea books, uh, wanted to do a book. And we were talking about going back and doing a book of, you know, from day one, that are collective pictures. But I kind of wanted to do something new. You know, initially I wanted to do something new. And um, having spent a month or two, whenever I had a moment looking back in the archive, going, oh, crikey, this is a lot of work and there's a lot of stuff to look at. Um, I'd actually rather do something else. And I spoke to Tara and just thought, you know, maybe we could go off on a road trip with Paddy and Liam and do some new pictures. And if we put them all together, we could make a book that was their story, if you like, at this time of sort of you know, go, going through adolescence and about to become adults. And how is Ireland changed in that time? And what kind of an Ireland are they gonna become adults in? So Tara brought over some clothes and obviously she knew them and, and was able to give them sort of signatures to what they were wearing. And uh, so we went on a great sort of five day road trip around Ireland, uh, including Knock and various places in the West. There's Paddy and Knock. And um, as, as each time that we went out to photograph over the years, I would interview them because I thought it would be really important that they both are still in Knock on a rainy day in Knock. Brilliant. That's high fashion there. <laughs> Did they like wearing these clothes? Was it a like oh, was it a really exciting experience for them? Did they have their own vision you, on they what they were wearing? They, they would tell you that they don't like being dressed up and yeah, they prefer <laughs> to wear their own clothes. But um, <laughs> um, there's a landscape is from Knock as well. Oh, it's gone. Um, they would tell you that. But yeah, you know, they had a great time. We all had a great time. It was. So we did quite a lot of landscapes as well, just a sense of Ireland. And um, here they are in the in the wild west on the bog. Very good. And um, yeah, so for me that was really, and this was one of the classic pictures from it, I think. This is the second time we went out, we went to Ballina Hinch Horse Fair. Ballina Slow Horse Fair, sorry. Ballina Slow, I know it well. <laughs> Yeah. Myself. yeah. Yeah, which was a great place to shoot and gave it a kind of context. And when they were younger, here they are breaking in one of the horses. You know, they'd have this great opportunity to live at marinas and to be have horses and get all that experience. And then at the fair. Getting some chips. Perhaps. Getting some chips. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and I, I like making stories. So there was a little a bit like with Pony Kids when I went off and interviewed all the kids, as many as I could find, uh, when we decided to do a book. And because I, somebody offered to do a book, and I thought, well, that would be wonderful, but it needs to be more than just the pictures. I want to hear the kids' voices. And so I went off and found all the kids, interviewed them and then sort of edited the text and created a little bit of a narrative about how they'd come in come in to be with horses and their experience. And of course, at that time, uh, when we were doing the pictures, it was all being closed down by the authorities and uh, they were coming out pounding horses. So there was a great story to be told there and I wanted to hear it from the kids, you know, first-hand accounts. And likewise with Paddy and Liam, it was, you know, the story of them growing up and becoming adults. 
and you know that, that it's, it's also this thing they went to uh when, when we were in the west of Ireland, we went to this horse race in mayo that takes place on the beach one one day of the year and uh they met a girl in the ice cream van who was selling ice creams and they wanted to get on snapchat with her so they got her address and mm -hmm. um later they found out that she was about three hours away from them and it was much too far to travel and forget it because um so i like the idea of the modern traveler who is really traveling from his couch they'll travel but not too far <laughs> yeah and i know in the summer their father would try to take them out the whole family off on the road for a couple of weeks and of course the guards would come the police would come quite soon and you know check what they're doing and uh, you know, can you move on from this site? It's not a campsite or whatever. And 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 the mother would always say, "Yeah, please t tell him to tell him to take us home. I don't want to be out here any longer. <laughs> <laughs> it'll get sent home, and it'll be happy except the father Tommy." So, going back to what you said about Snapchat and you know this newer generation, Paddy and Meme, they're young adults now. What do you think is the future for? for media and for fashion, especially today, there's there's a microscope on the creative industries because of COVID, because of the current context. Where do you see things evolving? I think there's going to be a massive change. I mean, people talk about going back to normal, but I think within fashion, uh, there aren't going to be too many survivors, I wouldn't think in terms of the retail. I mean, there, there are the big companies like LVMH, who are obviously, you know, enormously successful businesses that will be fine, I would imagine. Um, but I think a lot of other people just, and as we've seen already, uh, particularly in the States with J. Crew and even Marcus, various, various big companies that, that couldn't survive uh, without cash flow for a couple of months. And um, it shows sort of what a knife edge it was already on before COVID. And uh, going through the COVID experience, is, I think it'll wipe out a lot of people. And I wonder, you know, people have been talking for years and years about magazines uh, closing down and there won't be any magazines. But of course, what we saw actually the opposite, but a lot of them maybe published once or twice a year, but they've been kept going because of the advertiser, you know, and the big advertisers, Chanel, Prada, and, you know, all the big companies that will go and, you know, make deals and it's probably not very expensive for them but it's enough to keep the magazine going and so how much of that is, is still going to be viable um, when we return to normal as it were uh, so I, you know it's 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 very hard to know and I mean how many how many photographers and stylists and people can survive this uh, what we're going through at the moment what we've been going through um, and then, you know, we've got the added thing that, that we won't be able to go back to work in that same way until this is resolved in some, some, some way. And uh, so a lot of work is going to be local, I would imagine. Um, exactly. So I know in the past you've had shoots all over the world. You would even go there in advance to recce a location, to do pre-production work. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, the way it was before, because things are most likely going to be changing and perhaps the, the, the way things were done before it won't be yeah. like that anymore. So it'd be great to hear how you did it and perhaps how you I, think it's I, going to I would to say go. that, um, you know, the first big change was was the big sort of economic recession, the, the downturn in 2008 into 2009. Well, that, that, I didn't really notice that hitting fashion badly until maybe the early teens. You know, or at least my, my work continued in a way till about 2013, 2014. It felt like there was still reasonable budgets to do things. And now this was going hand in hand with digital. So obviously people were keen to shoot on digital and have that immediacy, which I always, I, you know, I, I feel a little bit we're at a point now where people aren't investing quite so much of themselves in making imagery. It's a bit of a tick box situation. But if you go back to, let's say, the late 90s and early noughties, when I would have been doing work for Italian Vogue and Luomo Vogue and um, many other magazines, I, I really would have had that approach where I would go off and recce a location. You'd have an idea, you know, you'd work with uh, with a stylist very closely and um, you'd talk about an idea 
And so for example, just one shoot I did for Italian Vogue, which was inspired by a photographer called Clarence John Lachlan, who was an American photographer from the South, who in the 40s and 50s documented all the, the derelict plantation houses. And you know, we were looking at the fashion of the time, which was all very skimpy, uh, uh, light, uh, you know, slightly ghost-like uh, outfits. Mm -hmm. so, some of the things we just thought, yeah, well, that that would be great. We could do like a, a family who are left over in one of these houses, living this rather sort of dream life, and uh, we could take my daughter and a friend and. Uh, a couple of models and yeah this this could be really great I'll go and do a recce on the Mississippi drive down the Mississippi and see if I can find any of those houses and good locations and so you know I went for a week and did that and then came back look at all the pictures refine the story a bit more refine the casting uh, then uh, so Kathy Castrine was doing the styling Kathy can look at the fashion a bit more and then we all set off again uh, a few weeks later and go and do the shoot. And we used to do a lot of shoots like that. Um, now, with Italian Vogue, you weren't, you were, I think they would give you $5,000 for the shoot, but you were happy to invest your own money into the project because you knew at that time that if you had a story in Italian Vogue, you would get you know, a campaign or some commercial work from it. And um, so you were happy to do that. And, and that's the way it worked then. And I think now, doesn't matter what magazine you're in, uh, there's no guarantee of getting a commercial job from it. You know, it's the, uh, I, don't, I, don't I don't think it works like that anymore. But that's the kind of preparation you would put into a shoot. Um, and whether it was, you know, in Ireland or Scotland or Zanzibar or uh, Mississippi or, you know, another time on a Luoma Vogue shoot went to uh, the Navajo reservation in Arizona and um, with the stylist Alan Kennedy, uh, you know, we just had this idea that the clothes sort of worked with the people and wouldn't this be a great thing to do? And, you know, for me, it's always been great to show other people. Like from very early on, I would just find people on the street and, and photograph them, sometimes alongside models, sometimes on their own. But I've always, I've always tried to find, you know, a different look, if you like, uh, aside from the sort of standard idea of beauty so we went to the Navajo reservation myself and my producer Dana we went for I don't know five days a week just to look around and to meet people and, it, and you know you have such great um, you have such great experiences going around and meeting people and you know our excuse for talking is that we want to take some pictures here's a camera and it's a great introduction to people and uh, so then, and then Alan would come out with all the clothes and we'd just go around photographing people and meeting more people and just putting together a really lovely story for the magazine. So, you know, at the end of the day, sure, you're just selling frocks and outfits, but, you know, within that, there is an artistry to it and, and a way of doing it and a way of creating kind of fresh imagery and exploring culture and different cultures. And for me, that's always been very exciting. Absolutely. I think you've captured the essence of the, the magic of the industry. Um, thank you so much, Perry, for sharing all of these stories with us. You've lived such a rich and colorful and energetic life of adventure, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I was wondering if we could just ask you, if you had advice for emerging creatives today, whether they're designers or photographers, but they're people that are you know, thirsty to break into this industry, what advice would you share with them? Um... I would say it's really important to research and to look at things. And it's by looking at uh, other people's work, be it a, a, design, a fashion designer or a photographer or a painter or a filmmaker. Um, uh, I think those, those for me were the kind of sources of inspiration, uh, magazines, of course, but, it, but, uh, but really anything that grabs your attention, that, that sort of catches your eye, explore it, really explore it. Go and look at paintings, go and look at photos. Um, study, you know, whoever's Simone Roche's um, dresses, whatever it might be, um, and, and, and it's through that that you can start making your own things. And you know, I think, and go and look at the great films, you know, um, that have been made over the years, and Antonioni and 
you know, all these incredible, uh, Terry Malick was a big influence for me, Badlands and Days of Heaven. Um, just, just look at these things and start making your own work. And then I think ideally try not to get forced into a commercial corner. Try and try and do what you want to do and go down that road. Um, you know, although it's tricky, you know, I've, I've done lots of commercial work over the years because um, it, it's paid for my personal projects. And some of it has been great and some of it's not been so great. And, um, and I think it's really that team of people you work with. So if you want to be a fashion photographer, you're going to be very dependent on a stylist. And I think that's crucial. And, 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 and the extended team, hair, makeup, the models, the people you choose, the people you want to go out with to, to do that. So, you know, some of these things are a bit more solitary, but I guess as a designer, that's, that's really powerful too. But certainly a lot of these things are collaborative and you've just got to have great, a great team. Teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah, <laughs> you need to know. If I look back at all the, all the, you know, what I, what I feel would be my most powerful stories, they've, they've been done with um, a really great team. I remember exactly who did the styling, who was doing hair, who was doing makeup, obviously the models, and you know, everybody, everybody brings something to it. It's, you know, there are many beautiful guys and beautiful girls out there, uh, but few of them sort of make it as a model because few of them are able to give you something just a little bit extra uh, that can make a, 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 the difference on a picture and, and make it a great picture. Okay, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your insight and your experiences with us. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? No, and, and, and the interesting thing about it, it, or it's, you know, it's changing changes um, you might go through periods like uh, 40 or 50 years where the photography didn't change and then suddenly there's digital and that starts a whole new thing which is only in its sort of infancy so who knows where that will go and um, you know I guess I guess at the very moment that we're talking the concept of anti-racism and diversity is, is very important it's an important thing for me uh, particularly as I chair a uh, anti-racist uh, NGO here in Dublin Sport Against Racism Ireland, also known as SARI. And I think, you know, it's very powerful in the sense that it's only got to this because somebody filmed that killing because they had a mobile phone. Now, if that hadn't been filmed, a lot of this may not have happened. And these, these very positive changes that are potentially going to take place. Uh, so that's the power of these instruments that we have in our hands and from taking pictures and making videos and films. And uh, that's pretty useful. Absolutely. Sort of, you know, it, it's adding to the democracy, if you like. No, I agree. I think it gives everybody the opportunity to have their voice heard. And as we said, it, it democratizes that space. Every, anyone can be their own news channel now. Anyone can be their own media platform, their own digital magazine. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of it will go unseen, but suddenly something very powerful will happen. And uh, you know, it's vitally important that there is that space. Absolutely. Harry, can I ask you a little bit about your work with the Hugh Lane Gallery, specifically to do with Francis Bacon? Yeah, well, that was an amazing project to photograph Francis Bacon's studio in London. Um, you know, I'd had a show of Pony Kids at the Hugh Lane. So the very first Pony Kids show was in Smithfield, as, as I'd said. And, and then Barbara Dawson, the director of the Hugh Lane, had seen that and, and loved the Pony Kids series. And so the first exhibition in a, in a museum or gallery was at the Hugh Lane and um, had a massive turnout and was a, a big success. And obviously I got to know Barbara a little bit um, in, the, in the period up to that. And uh, she, she knew that I was interested in Bacon and she, she was, you know, the gallery was being given the Francis Bacon studio that was in South Kensington in London. And she asked me, would I go with her and, and look at it and, and uh, document it before they took it to pieces and then put it up again in the, in the gallery. So I spent a few days in London over a period of time taking photographs in Bacon's studio. It was at Seven Reese Mews, South Kensington. And it was three rooms, essentially the studio room where he painted, and then a kitchen come bathroom where you could sort of almost lie in the bath and turn the cooker on and off, or 
and then a bedroom comes sitting room. And that's how he lived, very, very simply. Uh, because that's how he was most focused on working. And I think it was about, it was, an, it was a magical space, the studio. You can see it now if you come to Dublin and go to the Hugh Lane, they, they recreated it incredibly. I don't know how they did it. You know, they took the whole walls out and put them up again. So it was very clever what they did. Um, but it was an incredible space and he just had this west facing skylight it was the only source of light apart from a few light bulbs, just bare light bulbs. And he mainly worked in the morning. So the light would have been similar to that classic painter's north light. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was an incredible project. And we made a book and uh, exhibitions all over. So we did a set of limited edition prints, quite large prints. And, you know, it was, again, you know, painting is very powerful. Those images are incredibly powerful. Um, you know, about the human condition and what it is to be human and to, to, um, to, to be alive. Uh, and I think that, you know, by getting, having those experiences, um, you know, brings so much to one's work and it changes you forever going forward to have a project like that. Absolutely. And as you said, for anyone that's in Dublin, it's a must see. Um, to actually experience his original studio yeah. moved piece by piece, every paintbrush, everything, every piece of newspaper, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, and all of the, the stories around it and the photography that's also placed in the studio, which you were uh, obviously playing a big part of. No, because it was, it was fascinating. There were, you, you'd look into the studio and you, you would think uh, at first glance that someone had just thrown, that he had just thrown all his stuff in there. But actually, that was that was the method, and um, layers and layers, and I guess it was all that it was. His, those were his resources, and uh, anything could be pulled at any moment. Absolutely, well, there's a real sense of soul, a sense of movement. It's hard to believe that someone, ha as you said, hasn't been in there today painting. Um, it's an incredible, incredible place. So Perry, I know you're working on a new book at the moment. Could you tell us a little bit about how are you creating a book and where are you in that process at the moment? Yeah, well, the book is ready to go alongside this film uh, that Kieran Nikormak has made recently about my work. And, um, you know, I'm thinking along the lines of doing something similar to some books I used to make uh, some years ago. I guess I really made them as sort of portfolio books and they were a little bit like this one. Well, this, this was one of them, um, for example, I made, they're all made on the photocopier I had and sort of make a little box, a little slipcase, and then uh, a, a little book, but so quite small, but I love these kind of size books. And then it was just, just be, uh, I'll try and hold this up. So this one is probably falling to pieces a bit, but um, just to give you a sense of the, mixture of pictures. Uh, so it would be a mixture of, uh, this one's a bit broken up, but uh, so just different different pictures from different stories, mixing fashion and portraits and um, you know, juxta oh, juxta juxta images. <laughs> uh, this one's fallen off a spine, but anyway, give you it'll give a bit of a sense of yeah, that's from the Italian Vogue one in Mississippi with my daughter, Violet. And same trip we did a shoot for Luomo Vogue. And so that was from Jane magazine in Texas. With Fantastic. Uh, another Italian Vogue one. Um, Zanzibar. So it's just a, a juxtaposition of, uh, um, of Irish travellers, a, a young boxer kid, Francie Barrett, who I think was one of the first travellers to go to the Olympics. That was from a guest kids campaign. Um, so just putting, do a lot of work for De La Repubblica in Italy. Mm. And, um, done many, many stories for them over the years. There's another one for them that was done in Dublin. 
So, you know, we're working on doing something not dissimilar to that. Portraits, um, John Hurt, who was always great to photograph. Kid in Palermo. <laughs> another shoot we were doing for Jane. Um, you know, a draw from Bacon Studio with Giacometti. Um, the bathroom come kitchen at Bacon oh, Studio. Yeah. You weren't lying about the bath. So the just a lot of, uh, <laughs> and then Bella Fry, Zina, um, picture from Port of Spain in Trinidad. So just different, different images uh, from different times and um, Sinead O'Connor. And then Francie Barrett on the other page, the Traveller Boxer. So just thought it'd be nice to, oh, that was a shoot for French Vogue that I loved with the giraffes. Wonderful. And um, that was from an, another W shoot. This one was in Dublin. So going, you know, going back and uh, I was like that picture of Angelica Houston for a film she did in Dublin. Fantastic. All those kids that were meant to be her kids. Um, yeah, so lots of lots of different uh, images really from all over. And uh, when will we be able to discover this book? That's in Kayenta in Arizona, the Navajo Reservation. So that's from that story. Um, that's the studio of the Irish painter Louis de Brocchi, his studio in France. So hopefully by the end of this year, we're trying to get it. Um, that's a, I love that picture. That was from uh, the Druid Theatre in Galway. A production of At the, Big, At the Black Pig's Dyke that I saw and that one or two of my friends were in and, and I just wanted to document them. So I took them out from Galway to Connemara to do a series of pictures. Another picture, this was a Luoma Vogue story. Um, that trip to Mississippi, oh, that was another Italian Vogue in Ireland. With Audrey Marnie and Karen Elson. Um, this is for Jane Magazine in Bell Mullet. These two wonderful brothers that I found who were just kind of farmers, but they also painted into these very naive images and had this wonderful, uh, they had this wonderful, it's here. This was the, uh, that was the Virgin Mary on their kitchen table. I like the, the jazz. Page. Daz box beside yeah. the shrine. Yeah. It's a bit of pop art, really, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, this was a story. That, I love this story. This was done in Palermo for Jane magazine, and um, we went there and we cast. We just we found a, a girl and we found an, an older woman to play her grandmother. And we just went around Palermo, photographing them. And then we played football with these kids. <laughs> so it's just a, mi a mixture of, it's going to be a mixture of pictures from all over. Uh, this was a story in, these are two different stories actually, but both done in, in Vietnam, in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. One of those was for Marie Claire and one was for Arena. And then portraits around Dublin. This one here is the artist McDermott and McGough, photographed just outside my studio on Cable Street. And this by Wesley, who's very much from the Pony Kid time. But that was actually from a shoot for W. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be those kind of images. I mean, just going through the process now, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's when you go back through the archive, 
it's interesting because you suddenly open a bag of negatives and you go, wow, I, I, I'd forgotten completely about that and find some more kind of interesting images. So I think I so hopefully by the end of the year that will be that will be ready. Fantastic. Can't wait to see all of the images taken, you know, through your lens, documenting everywhere you've been throughout your life. So Yeah, we well, you know it's wonderful to travel because you really you know, you learn so much and you meet so many amazing people. Absolutely. We'll be travelling through your book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know I just haven't 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 met too many people the last few months. Except yeah. online. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and a new way to do it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Harry. Like, Abby and Ian would be uh, probably haven't noticed they're still on the uh, on their couch, not wanting to travel. <laughs> on Snapchat, they're traveling through Snapchat. <laughs> right. Harry, thank you so much for sharing your life experiences with us, for sharing also advice to emerging designers and creatives. Um, I'm really looking forward to reading your book, your new book, when it comes out and to diving back into your, your older books as well, as we spoke about Pony Kids, Paddy and Meme, so thank you. Hey, well, thank you.